Okay, well, I have a minute after, so I'll go ahead and introduce um, Nick, which I'm very pleased and honored to do. So everybody, um, welcome to campus, Dr. Nick McKinsky. So he's new to the University of Maine, of course. Um, he's been appointed as an assistant professor of political science and international affairs. Um, we're very lucky to have had the support of Dan and Betty Churchill um, to create Nick's position. Really, um, it was intended to build upon the success of the Climate Change Institute and help move us toward our strategic plan um, to engage more with policy-based research. In addition to that, it also, um, the hope was that it would establish the School of Policy and International Affairs as a leader in graduate education on climate change policy. So Nick brings to you, Maine, um, a wide range of experiences. He has a, a master's and a PhD in political science um, from the City University of New York's Graduate Center. Um, there he specialized in international relations and comparative politics. He also has a BA in international relations and political theory from Michigan State. But most recently, he's been in um, several postdoctoral fellowship positions um, at Laval and Boston University. Um, all of Nick's expertise is um, focused around migration. Um, so his work is built on considerable experience as well, working in civil society um, and with governmental organizations on migrant related issues. So he has two upcoming books, um, one with the University of Michigan Press and one with Rutledge. Um, that both look at um, the governance of migration. And um, one of the things that um, I think is really interesting and, and relevant for this group um, with Nick's work is that he's paying in both of those books specific attention um, to the failures of global, global compacts um, on migration to deal with issues of climate uh, migration and climate refugees. So we're thrilled to have you at the University of Maine, Nick. Thanks so much for being here and um, take it away. Sure. Thank you. Um, let me know if the slides or my mic stuff cuts out. Sometimes it has issues, but thank you so, so much. I'm really excited to present to everyone today. Um, I'm going to start off just describing some of my general research and then focus in more specifically on um, my contribution on climate migration governance and this new project, <clears throat> new project about aid that I'm, I'm working on. So um, as Cindy said, um, this is my first semester at University of Maine, and um, I'm split between the political science department and SPIA. Um, my specializations on global governance of migration, including climate migration, and that really comes, um, comes from my two book projects. Um, one of them, uh, the first book, the UN uh, global Compacts Governing Migrants and Refugees looks at really how the UN approached refugees and how it missed the ball on many of the climate migration issues. Um, the second book comes out later. It's on um, uh, the EU's response to refugees, really focusing on the most recent crisis. And that's where I did a lot of my, um, my field work. Um, I also am trying to look at within the upcoming climate negotiations, how climate migration is going to be part of that. So it, it sort of, you can see it building over the last five years, um, really within UN uh, circles. Uh, so today I'm gonna focus though on uh, climate migration and climate aid, migration aid. Um, I'm just gonna start off with a few examples. Um, in 2019, Cyclone Idy hit Mozambique and Zimbabwe with um, winds of over 110 miles per hour, causing massive floods, more than a thousand people died. And the UN estimated that 150,000 people were internally displaced with their houses and livelihoods destroyed. These 150,000 people are climate induced migrants, but they have few, if any, international protections. These climate migrants in Mozambique raise questions about sovereignty and responsibility. Is the international community responsible for helping climate migrants or is the national government responsible for this? In Ethiopia, the country is or was experiencing one of the most um, worst droughts on record with um, uh, displacing more than half a million people since 2015. Again, these half a million people are not protected by any treaty or international regime. These climate migrants in um, Ethiopia raise questions about different priorities. Should states prioritize preventing um, displacement by restricting land use, or should states prioritize protection of those internally displaced? The problem we're discussing today is that millions of people are displaced each year from climate change, but have no international protection. Why is there this gap and, and what are states doing about it? Uh, 
The key takeaway from my talk is that the UN attempted to fill this gap with um, the climate, uh, the, the global compacts, um, which were in 2018. But that agreement prioritized a certain type of aid that keeps people safe uh, in place rather than helping them to migrate. Um, which was, um, as we'll discuss, sides with the development aid and prevention approach rather than a rights-based approach. And importantly, we don't know what any of these unintended impacts of sort of aid for climate migrants or um, on the development side will have for things like development or governance more generally. So I'm organizing my talk, just starting off with this problem, thinking about wider gaps in governance, then thinking about the reforms that happened, and, and last, looking at my specific research, um, some new data that I have and, and what I'm presenting uh, on more generally. Again, the, the question is, what, um, what, why is there this gap in climate migration protections and what are states doing about it? So just last week, uh, the, um, the uh, World Bank came out with a report called Groundswell um, and they came out with a new estimate of what climate migration is. Uh, how much climate migration is going to happen. They estimate that 216 million people will just be displaced between now and uh, 2050. Um, we need a, a definition though for this. So what is climate migration? This is anyone who is forced to move because of climate related events. This could be a hurricane, cyclone, sea level rise. Uh, tangible examples are often um, Pacific islands that are submerged um, or people relocating from uh, sea level or desertification. Um, people have always been moving, of course, because of climate events and not something new, but since climate change makes extreme events more common, the number of people who are displaced also increases. And we can see this um, in some of the numbers and estimates. The estimates are really quite fuzzy. It, they've often range from just 250 million to over 100 million people per year. But like I said, the World Bank has this new estimate out this week, which it puts a, quite a solid number on it. Um, we can look at uh, more generally the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center gives us displacement um, as internal, internal meaning within a country, not crossing a border. Um, here they estimate that 30 million people were displaced because of weather, uh, uh, weather related events, um, 14 million of them from storms and 14 million from floods. Now this compares to 9.8 million who were internally displaced from conflict and violence in 2020 alone. Uh, but other studies show that people impacted by climate change are less able to move and less inclined to migrate, in part because they have less resources or as, as a result of climate change. And we also know that people are more likely to be temporarily, uh, temporarily uh, displaced internally and eventually return home without ever crossing an international border. At again, the Internally Displaced Monitoring Center estimates that in the last um, uh, 12 years, uh, almost 90% of all disaster related displacement was related to weather and only 11% related to geophysical. Now this is important uh, distinction that I'm going to get into later uh, related to my climate migration aid, um, but weather related is really the stuff that we're most interested in here. Now, if we look globally, 48 million people remain displaced from conflict and violence at the end of 2020 but only 7 million um, were displaced, uh, still displaced after disasters at the end of 2020. This is important because most climate displaced migrants return home after a few months when their communities have recovered. But during this period of time, uh, many uh, people who are displaced have no legal protections. Refugees, on the other hand, have the right to asylum, they have the right um, for the country of asylum to review their cases and provide protection and also food and, and housing often. The principle of non refoulement also guarantees refugees to not be deported back to the war zone um, in which they or in, if they have a, a threat to their lively their life. But none of these protections actually are applied to climate displaced people. Now, let me give you a little visual of the gap in protection. Here on the left, you can see the key treaties and international norms that cover uh, migration regime. And on the right, those that are covered by the, re uh, the climate regime. 
Political scientists often refer to these rules and institutions as global governance or regimes. That's sort of what all of my books have been about and how these interact with each other. In the middle, you can see the two regimes uh, are climate migrants who largely fall through the gap of governance. Now, global governance can be made up of different hard laws like the 1951 Refugee Convention or the Kyoto Protocols or soft non-binding laws like Cancun or Paris Agreements. Um, or they can include UN agencies like UNHCR or IOM or the UN Environmental Program. And finally, there are different types of international agendas like sustainable development goals that help um, guide different governments' actions. Now, climate migrants largely fall in the gap of this, but um, there are some examples. Refugees are a subcategory of migrants, of course, um, and states have agreed to provide additional protections. So the 1951 Refugee uh, Convention defines refugees as people who are persecuted directly by their government. But this leaves out those who are individually persecuted by governments, particularly those um, uh, who are not individually persecuted, sorry, um, particularly those who are displaced by conflict, famine, or climate change more generally. And this is a, a larger problem that doesn't just apply to climate change uh, uh, displacement. It's also for just mass, um, mass instability. In, in, um, um, so the climate regime is more focused on obviously slowing and mitigating climate change, not necessarily helping those displaced by climate uh, in particular. Uh, the UN has hosted lots of uh, summits uh, over the last 30 years, but only four of them have mentioned climate migration and only really in passing. However, uh, the last uh, Paris Agreement did set up the Task Force on Displacement, which can make recommendations on how to minimize displacement from uh, climate change. But of course, this is soft law and only optional. There are a few ad hoc precautions that protect climate migrants. For example, um, climate activists who may be persecuted by their governments would be protected by a refugee definition. And also some really interesting litigation happening now about the principle of non refoulement which is the idea that states shouldn't deport someone back to a place where they would be threatened or, or they, could, they could die. And theoretically that could be applied to someone in a disaster zone from, uh, from climate change. Now, a few cases have been tried um, in, for, for example, in France, a man who had asthma issues was stopped from being deported back to Bangladesh um, in, in part because of the high pollution levels. So you can see how this, uh, this norm could be applied more generally. And I think case law will really develop in this area. Um, however, these protections are often ad hoc and temporary, leaving a large gap for climate uh, protection for climate migrants at the global level. Now, um, let's see, the most innovative work is happening at the regional level, actually through soft non-binding law. You can see here a few examples, the Cartagena Declaration in, in Latin and South America, the um, uh, African Union Refugee Convention, which has a, a, an expanded definition. And in Europe, they also apply an expanded definition that could include climate displacement. Although in practice, it's not often applied to many refugees. In fact, my second book examines the different ways that the EU has overcome their divergent interests about responsibility sharing at the regional level. But of course, this broke down after the, uh, the 2016 refugee crisis, which is still ongoing in the Mediterranean. So if we think about the politics of protection uh, for climate migrants, there are quite large questions about how states should do this. And um, you can answer in many ways. Should states use hard law or soft law? Should they find permanent protection or temporary protection? Should they uh, advocate for rights for climate migrants or provide aid for climate migrants? And um, should they focus on protection of climate migrants or preventing climate migration from ever having to happen? Of course, these are binaries, but they're, in reality, they're not that. It's not either or, um, but it's, it's useful to think of them as different approaches. Um, and states often struggle to balance their national interests with the global public good of providing climate migrants. And as we see with most migration policies, sovereignty and responsibility sharing are often uh, really at stake. The big thing here is that there is a gap in global governance for climate migrants, and those questions played out in the negotiations for the global compacts. So now I'm gonna to turn to the, the meat of this. The, the global compacts were really the UN's attempt to try to provide some uh, climate, some protections for climate migrants. 
Um, however, in 2018, these uh, negotiations finally came through and you'll see I, I was quite disappointed by some of the outcomes. So the, for my first book, which I described a little bit before, looks at the international agreements, which are the 2016 New York Declaration on Refugees and Migrants, the 2018 Global Compact on Refugees, and the 2018 Global Compact for Migration. Each one, they sort of siloed the different rights or sort of um, priorities that would be given to refugees or migrants. And again, climate migrants, if they're um, displaced by climate, it's a huge question if they should be in a refugee category or migrant category. I've settled on using the term migrant because uh, the refugee definition is so clearly not being applied to them right now. But you can see how forced migration um, is directly related to climate-induced migrants. People aren't choosing to do it, they are being forced out of their homes. Um, so my book was based on three years of field work and interviews with UN and EU officials. And I examined sort of how global governance of migration and refugees has evolved. Um, some of the key points were that there are big shifts in global governance, uh, particularly moving from hard law to soft law, meaning binding to non-binding. So instead of having treaties, there are lots of compacts and agreements rather than um, uh, new institutions. There's also a focus on aid instead of rights. And last, the sort of Cold War politics that was focused on protecting refugees in a certain way has moved to one of nationalism. And you can see states approach these two compacts quite differently. For example, the refugee compact was more uh, conservative and focused on implementation and fundraising, while the migration compact was more ambitious and it covered all sorts of topics related to migration. In fact, many states were very enth enthusiastic about the global compacts, um, sorry, the migration compact, because they wanted to use the agreements as an endorsement of actually stricter migration policies like building walls or deportation. And some of that is actually in the, in the compact. So these tensions spilled out into debates in the, in the General Assembly. Here you can see a representative from Fiji on the left explaining that as a, a Pacific small island, we need access to new and predictable resources to help address the slow and sudden onset uh, effects of climate change. However, of course, not all states agree on this. For example, the Russian representative on, on the right, very outspoken against climate science and even denied that there was any connection between climate change and migration and rejected that there were any legal protections for climate migrants. So he says, we believe that climate change and environmental degradation and natural disasters cannot be construed under international laws reasons for refugee displacement. It's important to note here the difference in language. Uh, re the Russian representative uses the phrase refugee displacement because Russia has commitments under the 1951 Refugee Convention and is legally obliged to protect refugees. If he frames then the displacement of, um, of people as uh, migrants uh, from climate, then there are no uh, protections. Um, Overall, the Global Compact had a few really new things. First was that they included new definitions for sudden and slow onset disasters that are connected to climate um, migration. Of course, sudden onset disasters are things like hurricanes or earthquakes or flash floods, and slow onset are droughts, uh, land degradation, and sea level rise. Uh, this is the first international agreement on migration that actually addresses uh, climate migration. There are some informal documents and other things that the UN has, has, has drafted and gotten some agreement on, but this was a major agreement amongst uh, states. And I think a, a, a big uh, landmark because of that. The compact also recommends temporarily um, and giving work permits or humanitarian visas. This could be something like the US's TPS, temporary protection status that was applied for Hondurans after the hurricane Mitch, um, which in 1998 displaced millions and is still protecting Hondurans um, uh, today. The compact pushes for expanded versions of these visas, but the protection of course is only temporary. So we have to think about the, the balance here. And, and third, the compact prioritizes climate adaptation in countries of origin to prevent climate displacement from ever happening. And this means that aid will support states to develop adaptation and resilience plans that are focused on the majority, uh, that majority migration sending countries that are vulnerable to climate change. And actually the World Bank report that I mentioned at the beginning specifically uh, highlights hotspots around the world that are going to be 
um, affected by climate um, uh, climate change and particularly affected like delta regions or um, high populations in in low sea level areas and um, and where you could develop resilience plans because of that. And of course, my second project that I'm talking about today is um, focused also on how this aid actually um, has an impact on the ground. What does climate migration aid actually do then? So the, the balance within the um, global compact was a question between a rights-based approach on one side and aid-based approaches on the other. Tense negotiations took place over how to address these. The rights-based camp pushed for an affirmation and expansion of the principle of non refoulement that, um, that explicitly committed to not sending people back to climate disaster zones. And the aid-based camp emphasized that refugee resilience and um, promoting development aid um, and climate adaptation projects could be used as a tool for preventing climate migration from ever happening. Now, the rights-based camp lost that uh, debate. While there is one reference to non refoulement in the compact, they, they did not explicitly link that to climate migration or climate disaster zones. Instead, the aid camp secured special emphasis for development aid targeting climate adaptation. And all this shifts responsibility from countries of asylum to countries of origin and relies, of course, on voluntary aid, not, um, not sort of quotas of aid either. The big takeaway here is that the Global Compacts chose aid and prevention rather than a rights-based approach to climate migration. Now, this brings me to the third section of my talk and my uh, future research agenda. Here, I have presented several, um, the research I presented has several big questions that come out of it. Um, the first is how will the framing of climate migrants or climate refugees impact the legal uh, commitments in the future? And the big question of how these sort of framings will be brought up in the future uh, UN climate summits as well. It's, I don't think that climate migration is gonna be siloed just to the migration governance. We're gonna see it this November in um, Glasgow. And I think we're gonna see it again and again throughout climate summits in the future. Um, the second, though, is how do soft laws uh, change state behavior toward climate migrants? We don't see states signing up for big, ambitious binding treaties. Right? Paris has a lot of soft law commitments to it. Well, I think that's going to continue. But how does that change state behavior in practice? How are the nitty gritty mechanisms of change happening on the ground? And third, what are the unintended consequences of relying on development aid to address climate migration in general? And this is really where my research agenda has focused and I've developed a new data set that looks specifically at climate migration aid over the last few years. How much development aid is targeting uh, climate migration? Who are the main donors and implementing partners? Who, where and what is it being spent on? And what are the main activities of climate uh, migration projects? So, um, this new project um, that I've done it works on a big, um, it's about 2 million grants um, of OECD um, uh, development aid that I have subset into different ways to try to identify very specific climate migration projects. Of course, we have sort of a broader definition, but I'll show you sort of the, the estimation strategies. Uh, the first strategy uses a keyword search. It's really like an algorithm for, um, for choosing which uh, of these grants fits a climate migration uh, strategy. The second uses uh, the algorithm for, for migration, but then a government coded Rio marker. And these were markers developed at the Rio um, summit uh, to specifically mark development aid that's focused on Rio's indicators. So um, I'll, I'll show those in just a minute. And the third area, is uh, using IOM data. And this is to triangulate um, outside of the OECD data. Are we getting good estimates? Are we getting clean data? Um, and that uses algorithms to choose uh, the climate aid as well. So in the first estimate, we start off with almost 2 million grants. We have the project title, short description, purpose code, that sort of thing, tra traditional uh, development aid stuff. Um, we have a selection inclusion using keywords. So you can see how we choose if it's a migration uh, related uh, grant and how it's a climate related grant. And when we do that, we get down to about 6,000, 5,700 grants. Uh, so we're not looking at huge numbers here over about 20 years, but it is uh, significant in financial terms. 
and we've removed the geophysical hazards. And this is important because within the UN and other, um, other sort of data gathering initiatives, they often just look at environmental displacement or disaster displacement. And for our project, um, I think this is quite important to focus on just climate related um, displacement. And so when we look at this, we have um, a, a down to 5,700. And um, so if you keep in your head, climate migration, CM8 is that sort of first estimate using all algorithms. The second way is using the same data set, but using algorithms to choose the migration um, grants and then the Rio markers, same exclusion criteria, and it gets about the same number of grants. Although if you look at what well, I'll show you in a minute, the, the, they look significantly different over time. And the last is looking at IOM earmarked funding. And it's a different set of, totally different set of grants, but we're trying to triangulate outside. I mean, it, it could be overlapping obviously, but it's to say, are we looking at the right scale? Are we actually identifying what we want to identify? And it does raise huge questions. So it's, it's a big number here. Um, again, we assume that all of IOM's grants are migration related. So we're just subsetting it then for climate and we use the algorithm there. And again, use exclusion criteria. IOM is one of these agents, uh, agencies that, um, that specifically only looks at environmental migration. So we had to make sure we were removing the geophysical hazards from their data set. Um, and that gets us down to a much smaller number of only just 286 grants in their, um, their specific uh, work. So if we look over time, the main findings for this data set is that we have between 4.9 and $6.2 billion spent on climate migration over um, about 16 years, 2002 to 2018. This increases from about 50 million at the beginning of the data set to almost 300 million per year at the end. So real increase over time. The main channel sort of recipients of this aid are recipient governments and UN agencies, which is interesting. We need to think about who are the real actors on the ground and who are deciding what's happening on the ground. And the single largest actor was UNHCR, which is sort of different than what the reputationally people would say, IOM would claim to be the biggest actor in this area. And the main purpose is material relief and infrastructure, um, material relief being that it's, it's food aid and shelter aid in refugee camps for many people. Um, infrastructure, there's some climate adaptation infrastructure, but honestly, I think most of this infrastructure is a government infrastructure that's used then to administer other types of refugee and um, migrant aid. Here's a nice graph. You can see our two estimates. Um, they, they both go up, but there are a few spikes that you need to, we need to explain, which I'll, I'll get to in just a bit. Um, then uh, we can compare this to aid overall. Um, total aid is the gray in the background. Um, we can see that clearly climate migration is only a small percentage of overall aid, just 0.277%, right? These are the blue lines on the very bottom. Um, but the increase in climate migration aid outpaced smaller increases in total aid, climate aid, and migration management aid in comparison. During the same period, uh, overall total aid increased about 30%, whereas climate aid increased by 13%, and migration management aid increased by 356%. In this chart, the uh, total aid grays on the right axis while all the others are on the left axis in order to be able to see it there. Um, the chart shows that climate aid and migration aid generally followed the trend in total aid over time, while climate migration aid also follows total peaks, um, like the total gray peaks and troughs. However, the Rio subset, the sort of one that uses Rio markers, um, spikes in 2008, 2012, and 2018 in contrast to the other one. So we have something to explain that we need to think about there. Um, of course, climate migration aid is distributed unevenly around the world and geopolitics clearly plays a role. Here you can see that Mexico and Turkey are the two countries bordering the US and the EU, and they're the largest recipients of climate migration aid. This clearly reflects a global north anxiety about climate migrants. I have heat maps for other categories, so I'll just show you another one of them. Um, this is desertification, and you can see Kenya, Malawi, Indonesia, and Afghanistan re re received the most aid there. Um, 
just as an example of what some of these grants are, they um, have to be related to climate and they have to be related to migration and put together, but they don't necessarily have to be related to climate migration, right? It, it, there, there's a, a sort of um, selection bias that we might have here that the indicators can only get so much into what we're, we're focusing on. But here's an example of a partnership between Ethiopia and Kenya um, and uh, the governments and the UN development program. They specifically link that climate change is leading to resource scarcity near the border of Ethiopia and Kenya, and that they think that this could eventually lead to conflict. So they've set up local peace committees and cultural exchange programs and trained border officials on sort of the, the issues on this. Um, we don't know necessarily what the impact of this will be. Uh, there's $3.5 million being poured into this uh, specific program. So it will be interesting to see what its impact is. In, also concerningly though, is that Ethiopia, it was one of my larger case studies in my research, um, was the darling of the international community. Prime Minister won the Nobel Peace Prize, but last year also started attacking one of the Northern regions to gray region and, and closed the border to fleeing refugees. So $60 million of the climate migration aid that we're looking at has gone to the Ethiopian government and the Ethiopian government that's administering this aid is now uh, responsible for closing the borders um, at the same time. So we, we have to be really skeptical of what's happening in the end of this aid. And if there's um, fungible aid or, or siphoning that happens on the top of this. So if we look at the two estimates, I wanna show you the big difference here. The big difference is this green uh, bar. This is uh, grants that we included in the algorithm uh, estimate that were not marked by governments as a Rio like climate related grant. So what you can see is that there's a huge spike in 2009, 10 and 11. And that comes from uh, mostly from people who were displaced from floods in uh, Pakistan in 2008 and 2009, because floods were not counted as part of a Rio marker. But I think it's legitimate to include it in this because of its association with higher floods during climate change. Um, so this is an interesting, it reveals an interesting bias in the real markers and makes us think if it's important to rely on a real marker in the future. Uh, next, you can see the second estimate. This is uh, the real marker, which was hand coded by governments to make sure that it was related to environmental issues. It uh, has much more even increase over time. However, there are several huge grants that were included in 2018 because the UK government coded it as a Rio grant, but to our knowledge, doesn't seem like it should be related to climate or migration. So in a finer tuning version of this, I think we'll lose about half of that um, big peak at the end. Overall, when we look at Rio markers, most of the grants are in environment, while the uh, climate migration subset that uses algorithms had, um, had climate adaptation as the second highest, while uh, the Rio had climate mitigation as its second highest. An, an interesting difference in what's being revealed in those two. Um, so if we move to the third identification strategy about IOM data, now this was um, this is backend IOM data that um, we had an official at IOM share with us several spreadsheets. So it's um, it's very new and fresh, and we're trying to figure out exactly how to use it. But um, we found that three uh, three thirty eight uh, sorry three hundred eighty nine million dollars over a different period of time were used on climate migration by IOM. When we filtered it using um, uh, the OEC data for only IOM, you can see several other things going on here, right? Um, there's a big difference between what is matched and what's actually happening. Um, so overall, what we think is happening is that IOM is bragging a lot about what kind of funding they're doing and what they're getting from uh, as climate migration. One of the biases of this data could be that IOM is overcoding environmentally, um, whereas the OECD data, the governments weren't as concerned about coding in that way. Um, and it's something that we're trying to think more carefully about is how do we rely on both agency data and government coded data for um, identifying this. Uh, 
So the limitations of this data, as I said, there's, we use this algorithm versus the Rio. Um, of course, the algorithm is just a computer identifying a few words. Sometimes they're words out of context, which gathers, puts grants in the subset that shouldn't be there. The human coding has something else though, that governments um, have to first agree to a certain definition, then apply it uniformly. And we suspect that some countries like uh, Germany or France may try to overcode to emphasize that everything is related to green because they want to be seen as a leader in this area. And so we have to be suspicious of these things as well. Um, even still though, one of the outcomes that we want to uh, say of this um, from this data is to propose a new Rio marker, is that we think that they should be counting specifically climate migration as part of it and make it as uh, maybe part of the, the climate negotiations um, coming up as something that governments are counting actively, the work that they are trying, the money and the work that they're trying to do to help climate migrants. So we put forward in this paper that we've presented and, and it's a working paper that we're submitting to journals right now that, that has a definition of a new Rio marker that governments could adapt. And it has sele selection criteria similar to the one that we use to identify very specifically about migration um, and climate. Uh, but it also removes the non-geophysical hazards, right? So we want to make sure that, sorry, it, it, it makes sure that it's uh, not a geophysical hazard, which is not part of most of the other accounting that most, uh, that the World Bank or OECD are doing here. So just as a summary slide, um, the takeaway point is that the UN attempted to fill this gap in global governance for uh, climate migrants using the Global Compact. And the compacts prioritize climate adaptation and development in order to prevent climate displacement before it happens. This clearly sides with the development aid and prevention approach rather than a rights-based approach. And my research now about climate migration aid is looking deeply at what the aid is actually used for and if there are going to be any unintended impact on democracy and governance in other ways. Um, I'm very excited to hear uh, all your questions and the work that's happening at CCI, and I look forward to um, and the discussion. Thanks so much, Nick. Yeah, I uh, will stop sharing now, I guess. Yeah, probably so you can see everybody. There we go. That's good. Okay, thank you so much, Nick. Um, do folks have questions off the bat or comments off the bat? Yes, I'd like to ask a question. Thank you, Nick. That was very informative and we look forward to having you involved in the Institute and beginning to compare uh, our climate information with your, with your climate information. I think it'll be very exciting. Um, you, you may have, have mentioned this, but perhaps I didn't pick up on it. How would you rate a uh, government versus NGO uh, response to these issues and successes? Um, so we do differentiate them. Um, in the, if we look specifically at climate migration aid, uh, of course, lots of NGOs mm -hmm. are receiving the aid, um, but they aren't the top of the list, right? Recipient governments and UNHCR are the top of the list, the big actors here. So it, um, it still remains that when we're in displacement settings, when we're in like migration settings, governments want to take the lead on these projects because it's a sovereignty question. They're thinking about their citizens and protecting their communities and, and, and being the uh, responder of first resort, right? Um, first and last resort. Um, so in that way, the, the governments really do want to keep pushing that they're, they're ahead. Um, of course, the most innovative projects for um, climate migrants on the ground are first uh, climate migrant organized, right? These are um, users that are organizing their own sort of work and, um, and NGOs, local, local institutions. So there's interesting work being done there. It's a question of scale and how they interact with regional and government actors, right? Like, um, you may be allowed to, you may be doing work on the ground because the government support it and want you to be encouraging this sort of thing. So you can imagine big tensions happening between a state that is not wanting to relocate uh, or, or wanting to relocate climate migrants permanently and, um, and a local community saying, no, no, we want to stay put or we want to relocate in a temporary way. Okay? Absolutely very interesting there. Um, 
the one other thing I will say, and this comes out of some of my other research in Europe, is that there are strategic like uh, power politics that happen in when you select an implementing actor. Uh, oftentimes, if you have a transigent or um, very reluctant local government, uh, the UN or funding bodies will use delegated responsibility, this concept I'm working on in my second book, of avoiding the local government and giving it to an outside actor to implement on the ground, mostly because they're able to restrict the actual like work that's happened. Whereas if you give the money directly to the government, the government can do what they want with it because it's their territory. Whereas when you pay UNHCR to deliver 300 beds, they have to deliver 300 beds, right? Um, and so this is a trend that we have to think carefully about. Like, is it empowering? Like there may be a, a quick fix to providing aid for climate migrants is to use the UN. But if we're trying to develop long-term sustainable institutions, um, empowering and putting money through like the national agencies may be a better choice, even if they're not doing exactly what the international agenda wants them to. These are similar trends that happen across the climate negotiations as well, but interesting when I think about it in the migration setting. Thank you for your question. Well put, thank you. Anybody else want to jump in? If I, okay, then I'll take, <laughs> I'll take this chance. Nick, this is such interesting stuff and I, um, it is, as you said, so interesting to me how so many of these trends are replicated like throughout the climate negotiations. I mean, particularly this kind of trend towards liberal governance models yeah. that move away from rights and toward kind of voluntary market-based mechanisms. Um, I wanted to ask you specifically about that. So I know that in the Warsaw mechanism for loss and damage, there's been, they have like a working track on, I think they call it human mobility. Um, and I think that they are, are trying to link that to some of the carbon markets so that some of the funding would actually come through the carbon markets. And I just was curious, like, is that also a common refrain in, I mean, as we're moving toward more liberal models, are you seeing more like market-based funding mechanisms come into play for mobility? This is so interesting. Um, so I just published a paper called Refugee Commodification that looks at how um, uh, not specifically climate migrants, but refugee model in general has been um, commodified in a way that you can trade, sell, and threaten refugee populations to get aid in a certain way, right? So you see somewhere like Turkey threatening to, uh, to like open the gates of Europe if EU doesn't um, fund the, the refugee camps. Similar things in Pakistan, Kenya, uh, Colombia, similar sorts of threats like that. But there are other non-coercive versions of this that are that are, are similar, um, in which you see the, the commodification in which it's linked directly to um, financing, like a, a, a good terms on financing from the World Bank. Um, they, they have a, a priority lending program specifically for refugee hosting uh, communities. So there is increasingly complex financing mechanisms and it's interesting to tie it into the market, uh, the, the, the carbon market. I haven't um, seen this pr proposal exactly. Um, what I would say is um, the idea of issue linking within the migration um, regime is very, very popular that we try to connect diverse issues because um, at least within migration, like international migration politics, sending migrant countries and receiving migrant countries have fundamentally different interests. In a similar way to the global north and the global south in the climate uh, regime have very different interests at this, this specific moment of how they're gonna negotiate. And so the issue linking across different issues. So um, traditionally it's development aid and deportation schemes are often linked, right? So uh, the global North gets a little bit of deportation, the global South gets a little bit of aid and they're linked together in agreements. Well, you can see the same thing happening in aid and uh, uh, carbon, um, uh, the carbon market. Uh, very interesting. And we haven't ever had a global regime on this. 
which would be an incredibly powerful step, right? Uh, incredibly powerful. It's usually bilateral, sometimes regional, very few regional sort of agreements like this, but having a global regime would be a huge step forward. Thanks, Nick. Mm -hmm. Nobody else questions or comments for Nick? I will say, um, I'd love to hear any advice people might have about the different estimates and how we frame them. Because in the paper, we sort of say like, obviously they're two different ones. There's some variation in the first two. The IOM is really just a, a, a gut check, which says like, IOM, like agency specific data is very f different than uh, like universal data. Um, the question is, should we be trusting and advocating for another Rio marker? Or are we actually advocating for more bias in a coding system via that? Um, which, yeah, big open question there. Yeah, I <clears throat> can't answer your, the question you just posed, but in mm -hmm. terms of uh, making estimates for the future, the estimates for the future are largely based on very simplified linear uh, IPCC projections that are, they're fantastic because there's so much agreement, but they don't necessarily represent what will happen in the near future. There are places that are more sensitive than others. Some of this is identified in the model reconstructions. A lot of it's not. The model reconstructions just basically show you things getting warmer everywhere. And that's not the way it has been working. So I think it would be very interesting to sit down particularly with Climate Reanalyzer, which Sean has developed and uh, talk about the, how, how those, if you could tell us exactly how they're made, we might actually be able to come up with more refinement uh, or at least a very interesting point of discussion. But I'm, I'm sure they could be refined better because regional scale understanding of uh, future climate is very, very generalized to the point at which um, in many ways, it, it's, I wouldn't, it's not harmful, uh, but it, um, it can create problems because if you just mm -hmm. suggest that the planet is warming evenly everywhere and it doesn't, then the people who are in the places where it doesn't actually change that much, and there are still some places, of course, don't believe anything. Uh, and then if you add all of the skeptic views, uh, um, sort of suggesting that uh, this is really only about temperature. There are no other impacts such as precipitation, winds, uh, various health uh, impacts. It, it oversimplifies the story and it's easy to have people become disillusioned. Um, Sean and I did some uh, plausible scenario planning uh, as part of USAID work uh, for Mali. So we could show you that and maybe that might yeah. be a starting point. That would be great. I, I know most of these projects have geotags to them, so it would be interesting to get them closer to the geotag rather than, mm -hmm. like I'm, I'm, I'm aggregating at the country level right now, but we could do like actual geotagging and have more specific environmental um, uh, push factors per that as well. Um, I think it would also be very interesting um, to make projections about uh, from our point of view, which may be exactly the same as IPCC, without a doubt, but I'll try and make some projections about where we think the worst case scenarios will, will be in the near future. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Nick, I think the question you raise is so interesting because the, well, I think it's great that you're triangulating, right? You're using three different sources, which, you know, it's really interesting that the first two match so closely. But I think that, these same conversations have been happening kind of in the adaptation funding space more generally, right? And it's because of this idea of like, can you actually prove additionality? Like, is this funding <laughs> just okay. the same pot of money being moved from like generalized development funding into adaptation spaces, or is it actually additional and then could be counted towards, you know, a, a regime's um, contribution toward, you know, some of these pledges. And it, it strikes me that it's almost like, what's the cause du jour, right? And if you just start coding around that cause du jour, are you really actually giving any more money um, 
mm -hmm. for adaptation and mitigation, or are you just re um, tagging it? So this is this is the general story from the Europe side. I mean, it follows that exactly. So pre two thousand fifteen, a lot of development funding was put through a neighborhood fund, and like um, uh, it's called. Uh, uh, DG um, Devco, right? It's the, the the development agency. Huge pots of money. They renamed it and re like double dipped it to be called the EU Trust Fund for uh, Africa, which is a fund specifically to prevent irregular migration in Africa. Okay, so I took that pot of money, which is a different data set, and subset it down to climate migration as well. They have those uh, grants specifically with climate migration, and we have coded. Um, all of their project documents as like content analysis of it. And once you do that, you start to see organizations that were clearly around for the last 20 years, just change the language that they're using to hit the new target stuff, right? And like, it's a great sustainability strategy for them. They have a new, like they have a new uh, way of keeping their money going, but does the work change on the ground? Does it actually have, do they have the expertise to be working on climate migration? Is this having any of the impacts that we think? It's not clear, right? Not clear at all. But so that's, um, so, so this, I showed you the quant side of this project, but there's a big qualitative side of the project where we downloaded over a thousand documents for um, uh, their migration projects in general, and a subset of them are climate migration um, for Kenya, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt. And we're looking at, at it as a, a migration route um, where people travel as transit migrants through towards Europe. And Europe is paying each country along the way to try to stop them, right? And uses different ways to stop it. Sometimes it's youth employment schemes, which are literally just paying kids to stay there, right? Like there, there, there's not much more than that. Um, and some of them are environmental programs where they're like rebuilding the um, roads in certain areas to help agricultural production so they can keep, so, that, so you can stay there rather than um, leaving. Fine, great projects, but like the onus of the whole thing is at the very beginning about preventing migration to Europe and is a rebranding of a huge pot of money that was um, was previously something else. And then, so, so that pot of money went from 2015 to 2020. And um, this year they have rebranded it to now another general fund for all over um, the Mediterranean. So you can see how it like, it cycles throughout time. Um, but I am interested to see how this qualitative project matches up with the quant project in the end. We're still trying to link it um, uh, over time. Okay, um, anybody else last thoughts, comments? Dan, I'm going to be surprised if you don't have any puns today. I thought I wouldn't subject a brand new faculty member to that. <laughs> I love a good pun. Oh, well. Well, then beware. Nick meet Dan. Next time. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, Nick, thank you so much for the presentation and your great work. We, um, I, I'm sure I can speak for many people on the call that we all look forward to working with you. And um, thanks for being thank here you. today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I really look forward to it as well. Okay, everybody, enjoy your the rest of your Monday. Bye.